Hey friends, this week's scripture passages come from Matthew 9 and Hosea 5. Manny Ramirez played outfield for the Boston Red Sox during most of the aughts, including their World Series seasons of 2004 and 2007. He was different from most Major League Baseball players in both his excellence in play and his lack of excellence in appearance. He was a great hitter, but often disheveled. He frequently wore his jersey partially untucked, and his batting helmet appeared to be half-rusted. He also engaged in unusual behavior at times. Sometimes he'd seem to forget there was a baseball game going on while he was in the outfield. Instead of picking at the grass like so many little leaguers do, though, he'd disappear into the Green Monster, the nickname of the scoreboard in Fenway Park. He once gave a high five to a fan during a double play between his catching a fly ball and throwing it to an infielder. Once he was even tagged out trying to steal first base from second base. Because of such incidents, the phrase, that's just Manny being Manny, became popular in Boston and was evoked when Manny did something inexplicable. In reflecting on the actions of Jesus in today's passage, I was left wondering if sometimes Jesus' disciples said a similar thing about him when he acted unexpectedly. I do it myself sometimes. Like when Jesus invited a tax-collecting trader to join their intimate circle. That's just Jesus being Jesus. When he helped out a synagogue leader who perhaps was in cahoots with those questioning his teachings. Jesus being Jesus. Saying a girl who is clearly dead was only sleeping. Aside from making me wonder if the Greek is better translated, it just so happens that your daughter here is only mostly dead. I'm left thinking that's just Jesus being Jesus. Please understand I'm not directly comparing the work of Jesus to that of Manny Ramirez. Sure, Manny helped end the evil empire of the 2004 era New York Yankees, but there was a greater resemblance between Jesus and Red Sox center fielder Johnny Damon. Regardless, Jesus often acted unconventionally during his earthly ministry. Unconventionally, but unquestionably good and unquestionably merciful. Reflecting on the actions of Jesus in Matthew 9, Stanislaw Witkowski writes that Jesus brings back mercy in interpersonal relations and emphasizes its absolute priority in confrontation with tradition conceived of as purely external ritualism, legalism, or imposed human tradition. Thus, Jesus sometimes found himself in conflict with those who championed tradition and convention. Some in today's story asked why he ate with tax collectors and sinners. A few verses later, Jesus is asked why he doesn't often fast. His response to the first group demonstrates that Far from undervaluing his faith tradition, he prefers its manifestation over rote implementation. The guy who made perhaps the most famous sacrifice in human history references the prophet Hosea, instructing his questioners to go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. When Jennifer and I entered Market Square Presbyterian Church for the first time, it wasn't to attend a worship service. We were there for a Market Square Concerts performance by an ensemble from the Harrisburg Symphony. That said, since the church to which we belonged at that time no longer had any children attending aside from our daughter, we had been searching for a community where she would have peers. Full disclosure, I had not considered attending a Presbyterian church. My mental image of Presbyterianism was dated, and I associated it with a strict Calvinism and restrictive theology that are no longer widely present in the denomination. But when Jennifer and I read the materials in the backs of the pews before the concert, we began to be introduced to a community that was broader and more vibrant than we expected. We came to church the next day and have been attending ever since. Market Square has offered a space for our daughter to learn and grow, and we also found its unapologetic progressivism appealing. 
For years, we had been attending churches where the specter of Christian nationalism held sway and where members of the LGBTQ community are not permitted to be ordained or married. While I respect those who continue to affect change from within such faith communities, we were ready to take a step forward. And then there was Market Square's worship service. If you come from a background like mine, which values organ music and hymn singing in parts, as well as well-crafted liturgy and lessons, I don't need to tell you how great the worship is at a church like Market Square. We even recite the efficient debts debtors version of the Lord's Prayer, just like we did in the church where I was raised. For a constructed Christian like me, Market Square seemed just right. The language, music, and message all resonated with me on Sunday mornings. Thus, I began reaching out to some of the folks I knew who had stopped attending church, folks sometimes referred to as duns, and invited them to visit Market Square. Some have taken us up on the offer, but strangely enough, most have not become regular attendees. For whatever reason, the language, music, and message at Market Square don't resonate for them the way they do for me. And while some of my friends might be borderline irredeemable, I don't think that's true of all of them. In the years since we first visited Market Square, most of which were spent attending seminary, I've been exploring why we do church the way we do, and why church the way we do it is failing to connect with a growing number of our neighbors. I've spent a lot of time deconstructing my faith tradition and connecting with many others doing the same. It turns out there are a variety of reasons people choose not to attend church. Some know us only through the dominant narrative that ties Christianity to nationalism, hateful behavior toward LGBTQ populations, and other narrow political issues. Others associate church with clergy sexual abuse or other scandals. Others associate church with hypocrisy and a failure to do Jesus-y things. And for others, the language and music found in church is just too foreign to have much meaning. Christianity is the fastest growing religion in the world, but the churches in our country are not reflecting that. What might we be missing? Returning to today's scripture passage, Jesus referred the Pharisees to the prophet Hosea, whose writings remind us that God desires mercy and not sacrifice, knowledge of God and not burnt offerings. Like so many of the prophets, Hosea was telling God's people that religious ceremony comes second to hesed, a Hebrew word that can be translated in this context as mercy, goodness, or steadfast love. Thus, the actions of Jesus in today's gospel reading can be interpreted as going deeper than just making people better. He wasn't taking care of business and moving on. As Alan Culpepper writes, the goal of healing rather than simply curing, that is, the goal of restoring persons to a state of well-being and social reintegration into their families and communities requires attention to the emotional, social, and spiritual well-being of persons as well as their physical health. So Jesus was investing in people and their communities while at the same time sending a message to the larger society, including the powers and principles of his day. His miracles demonstrate God's power in a Roman world in which inhabitants experienced the powers of numerous gods and goddesses. They also manifest compassion in a context in which many understood ailments to result from sin, the devil and demons, angry gods, and hostile people. God's empire rules over all forces in compassionate and transformative ways. Jesus models what it looks like to invest in individuals and communities while speaking truth to power. If our mission as the church is to continue his work today, what should that look like? And for what should we be known? A few months before we attended that concert at Market Square, I received a call to seminary. I learned that I was to take another step in my involvement with the church, one that required further study of theology and scripture. I wasn't sure what that would entail at first, but after joining Market Square and becoming Presbyterian, I thought the path forward was clear. I'd pursue ordination and become a pastor in a church. 
I continued my progress toward a Master's of Divinity degree while adding additional classes, like a year each of Hebrew and Greek, and working my way through PCUSA ordination exams. Then the Holy Spirit became involved. I received a new call to build a community that offers a different kind of space. Thus, the seed for what has become intertwined was planted. I spent a few months in discernment, then shared the idea with Cheryl Galen, the executive presbyter for our area, who until her recent retirement helped coordinate local churches. She introduced me to 1001 New Worshiping Communities, an initiative within the national denomination to create innovative and experimental faith communities. I was able to get connected with the assistance they offer, which includes discernment support, coaching, participation in a cohort with other NWC leaders, and grant opportunities. In the following months, I became equipped to make Intertwined a reality. Intertwined views faith through the lens of ecology. We're intertwined with God, with one another, and with the rest of creation. It offers a home to those who have left the church, have never attended church at all, or who encounter the divine most easily outdoors. To address the cost of having a church building and the obstacle that such buildings pose for some, we meet instead in public spaces. Our Sunday gathering occurs in the afternoon and involves time for centering, sacred readings, and prayer. Participants bring a camp chair and we gather outdoors when the weather permits. For most people, it's not a fit. But for some of those who have not found a faith community among our existing worship spaces, it is. And for those who have been through the process of deconstruction, it offers a place to reconstruct. Katrina Zaitza, a leader associated with the Poor People's Campaign, describes NWCs as lifeboats drifting in the ocean alongside cruise ships, which represent conventional churches. Sometimes people jump off the cruise ship, sometimes they are pushed off, and sometimes they can't board them in the first place. The lifeboats offer them a way out of the water. NWCs are a yes-and proposition. They are not meant to succeed churches like Market Square. They're meant to supplement and partner with them. They also offer an opportunity to overcome the siloed behavior you so often see among established churches. The agile nature of NWCs mean they can quickly adapt to supplement the efforts of other faith communities in terms of service and action. They can also better respond to the needs of younger generations, since we've never done it that way before, is considered a compliment rather than a discouragement in such environments. Today's scripture passages remind us that following Jesus means practicing steadfast love before yielding to convention, that the church is meant to be bigger and more diverse than it currently is, and that knowledge of God doesn't always come through traditional practices. Thus, we should never stop questioning and never stop defying custom where it waters down the message of extreme love, mercy, and justice found in Scripture. In a nod to our theology, we should never stop reforming. This message was originally supposed to end here, but after what might have been the driest May ever recorded in Harrisburg and the haze and smell in the air last week, I was inspired to share a little bit more. While we are talking about creating a better future for younger generations, let's not forget the role that ecological justice plays in that. Extreme drought and intense wildfires will continue to swiftly worsen if our consumptive behaviors do not change. Sometimes mercy looks like healing. Sometimes it looks like preventing people from getting sick in the first place. Acts of goodness toward future generations are realized when you trade in your gas-powered lawn implements for electric, bypass air travel when possible, shun products that come in plastic containers, especially drinks, and avoid beef consumption. If you have the means, replace your gas-powered car with one that plugs in and consider solar panels for your home. Any money you deny the fossil fuel industry is an investment in the future of humankind. Hosea writes, let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. 
his appearing is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us like the showers, like the spring rains that water the earth. We sure could use some of that rain about now, but in the meantime, we'll realize God's kingdom in glimpses born of mercy, goodness, and steadfast love. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you for joining me for this week's reflection. While you're here, please click subscribe and also check us out on Facebook or Instagram. We're intertwined FC.